Okay. Um, so I will go now into a bit of a, of a new topic in deep learning, which is the one of set prediction. Um, this is one. This is why the, the title is towards um, set learning and prediction, because this is still not, let's say, a finished project. Um, I do want to give credits for the slides to um, my collaborator, Hamid Reza Tofigi from the University of Adelaide, uh, because he did most of the material. OK, so I, as I said before, uh, we're interested in that, uh, because um, deep neural networks are actually really good uh, at many real world problems. But they are kind of limited. Um, to the, to the structured input and output that we have to fit to these neural networks. So essentially, we need a set of um, either vector or uh, matrices or tensors, which are actually ordered. And the order actually needs to make sense. For example, the orders of a pixel. And they also need to be fixed in size. So an image has a fixed size. Uh, then we can use fully convolutional networks, for example, to deal with different sizes. Uh, but in general, we want also a fixed size output. For example, we want to have a prediction for 1,000 classes or 100 classes or you know, a fixed number um, of classes in order to perform, for example, image classification. Uh, but actually, many real-world problems are um, described as sets rather than these tensors or matrices. And so um, just to recap a bit what, uh, what a set versus a vector is, so uh, we have that um, a vector, um, sorry, that a set is actually not fixed in size as opposed to a vector, and also is invariant to the order of the entities. So for example, uh, we would have this, um, these two sets, which are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 3, 1, 2, 4. So in this case, sets of size 4. But the order um, has been changed. The order of the entities within these sets, which are just these integer numbers, has been changed. Uh, but the two sets can be considered equivalent. Uh, nonetheless, if we just go to vectors, it's clear that the vector 1, 2, 3, 4 is completely different from the vector 3, 1, 2, 4. So you can see already the problems uh, of uh, using a neural networks with sets um, rather than vectors. Um, so let's go um, into classic um, deep neural networks. So the classic network. Uh, you want to actually optimize um, a series of parameters, which are W, with respect your, to your structure input, which in this case is X. So it's, for example, the image. And um, you want to optimize it to perform a, a certain task, which you define also as this fixed length output, in this case, Y. Now, uh, what happens if um, this output is actually not, for example, um, a classification task, so you don't have a fixed number of classes, uh, but you have, for example, tags, which you cannot express as vectors. So what I do mean by tags is, uh, for example, the task of image tagging, in which you have um, an image. For example, in this case, there's, uh, there's a kid playing with apparently a joystick. And so what you want as output is a series of words, but you don't know how many words. And these words actually have to describe this image. So of course, um, in this image, we have two words, person and joystick. As soon as you change the image, you have to maybe add one more element to this set, because now you would need three words to describe the image um, that is input to the network. Or it can be that there's actually an empty set as an output, because you have not trained your network um, to describe these particular scenes. And so there's no word that you can say, um, because there's no person, there's no dog, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for this, you cannot have this fixed size output, but you need to have a more flexible output, which is defined as a set. Um, so the, the let's say, um, current existing solutions, which are only um, an approximation of that solution, is um, by no. using RNNs or LSTMs um, and treating actually this output these elements of the output as a sequential, um, as a sequence, basically. Um, so you would have that your solution would not be a set with um, dog, bicycle, uh, person, but it would be rather a sequence of words that the network is outputting. And at the end, you could train it to output um, the, um, an empty uh, word, for example, to indicate that there are no more objects in the scene that you want to detect. Um, so the problem with this is that um, you actually are not guaranteeing that you have a valid solution. So you might have output dog, bicycle, and then again dog. 
And at the same time, um, the order actually um, does not have any meaning. So why should I output first person, then MySQL, then doc, mm. and not something like the other way around? So it isn't clear what the order means in this case. Um, so there are a bunch of uh, application examples. Maybe the, the most um, prominent one is the, the one of object detection and localization. Uh, so you have seen some of the uh, state-of-the-art detections, faster RCNN, YOLO, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what they all do is um, they take um, an image, they parse it through a neural network, they have uh, a bunch of proposal boxes, uh, which then they evaluate, and at the same time, they do need to prune these bounding boxes uh, with some heuristics. And that is, most of the, in most of the cases, uh, non-maximum suppression. Um, and what happens in these cases is that if you have very crowded scenes where you have a lot of partial occlusions, this non-maximum suppression is going to actually kill some of your detections, which are actually, for example, real people. So let's observe in um, this case where you actually have um, some more raw output of faster CNN. So this is still not processed by non-maximum suppression. Once you pass it through non-maximum suppression, you get the result on the right. Now, I'm just going to highlight the bounding boxes so that we can see the results more clearly. Um, there are actually a couple of persons in the background, which means that the bounding boxes are much smaller than the persons in the foreground. And these two boxes are overlapping so heavily with the boxes in the foreground that they will actually be suppressed by the non-maximum suppression. So they will not appear in the final result. And these two bounding boxes actually do belong um, to two persons which are actually here on the background. Now the problem of dealing with bounding boxes is um, precisely this one, that you don't actually have a detection around the person, but you have a huge box that actually overlaps with possible persons that you would be perfectly able to detect because you actually see um, almost all of them. So um, this is essentially a problem of not being able to express this output as a set, uh, but rather having this fixed, uh, this fixed structure and so having to deal with proposals and heuristics like non-maximum suppression. Um, so um, now let's imagine that we say, well, let's just train a network um, to detect five bounding boxes. So I want to directly output the location of five bounding boxes. And I don't want to do it with, uh, with proposals or anything like that. So I want to take directly the image, pass it um, into the neural network, and being able to detect these five pedestrians. Now what I can do is I can output um, the coordinates of the pedestrians, the width and height, and this is going to be um, my input uh, and my output that I want to train the network with. Now what happens in the next frame is that the pedestrians have moved. And so if I just order them, for example, by coordinate, which is like a, an arbitrary order, you see that there has been a shift between the blue pedestrian and the red pedestrian. So before we had such an order, and now you will see that the red and blue trajectories are shifted. So there has been a seemingly random shift because this order actually doesn't mean anything for my output. These detections need not be ordered like this. They could be ordered completely differently, and I would still have a valid output. And at the same time, what happens is once I go to another scene, the identities or the colors of these boxes, and therefore the others of these boxes, mean absolutely something different. So these pedestrians here are not the same pedestrians as here. But still, the order um, is the same. So the order in this case has, again, no meaning. And there comes a problem, of course, when you have a six pedestrian and you actually have to add it um, to your output. So this is like a, a normal, um, let's say, a prominent application where sets could be useful to have instead of output vectors. Same goes for uh, instance level segmentation, which is also dealt with proposals <coughs> and a bunch of, uh, of other applications. Um, now, let's, um, so I've said already that um, Current uh, machine learning approaches cannot deal with these sets, especially neural networks can still not deal uh, with these sets. Um, so can, what can we do about it? So there's a bunch of actually set learning literature, and I'm just um, leaving you the reference here so that you can 
um, you can read that if you are actually interested in that. And I'm going to talk about um, three of these works. I actually, I'm going to talk only about uh, one of them in particular, which is um, the one we submitted for, um, for NIPS this year. So um, when, uh, when dealing with sets, of course, um, you can have several combinations. So you can have still um, structure inputs, for example, images, but having a set as output, which would be the case of um, detection or image tagging, etc. You could have also set input, set output, for example, for graph applications. And potentially, you could turn this into a recurrent set network for uh, video analysis. But out of these three applications, or like these three configurations, let's say I'm going to talk about the first one, because this is um, where we start. So we start by having a structure input, which is always going to be an image, and then having a set output. And so um, there have been a series of works towards um, the final, final goal of really having, having fully learned structure input set output. Um, the first one was just about um, learning the cardinality of the distribution, so how many elements are going to be in my set. Um, the second one was about jointly learning the cardinality in the state distribution, so these bounding boxes, for example, that we want to predict. And the final one is um, the one that I'm going to talk about, which is also about learning the permutation. So um, let me just start by describing a, a little bit the, the notation that I will use. So um, this defines actually a set. You don't know the cardinality. So in this case, I define um, cardinality as this value m. And you don't know the permutation. So you don't know how many elements you have in your, in your set. And you don't know um, what is the order of these elements. Now, if you fix the cardinality, let's say um, by, this, um, by this expression here, then you do have that this um, set can have only this m number of elements. But they still can be randomly ordered. If you add permutation on top of that, and by permutation, I'm going to express it as this um, pi um, vector here. So this actually represents the order of the L M elements in our set. Now you do have that um, this ordered set. So we know the order of this set. We know the cardinality of this set. So in the end, this is just a tensor. So of course, if we would fix or we would learn the permutation and the cardinality, we could express any um, possible set as just a tensor. So um, this is actually uh, what we're going to do with our network. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to find um, all the possible uh, permutations, which in the end is, uh, is such an expression here, given the cardinality of our set. So we first, uh, let's say, want to fix the cardinality of the, of the set. We want to know how many elements we have in there. And then we can quickly compute how many permutations we have, because the, the order of the elements within the set is just, uh, it's just a fixed number. So um, in order to, um, to make such a prediction with set, we have, um, so this is essentially what we want to do with the neural network, right? Before we, have, uh, we had that our output was actually a tensor. Now the output is a set. Um, the input is still going to be a tensor, so it's going to be an image. These are still the set of CNN parameters that we want to train. And now the first thing is that we need to have some sort of distribution on the cardinality. And this was basically the work of the first paper that I mentioned. So we do have um, some probability of how many elements I have in the scene. For example, how many persons, how many boundary boxes do I want to predict given my input and given my parameters. So this, this can still be defined as a distribution. Um, this is just a normalizing factor, so just so that uh, mathematically everything is correct. And now the interesting part is what is the distribution of my elements, which I, I already know how many elements I have here because I have it fixed from this side. So now if I say, well, I do have only n, m elements of the set, I want to know what is the distribution of these elements. And the trick here is to actually decompose this probability with the permutation. So I do have um, that 
given um, that I know the number of elements in my set, I have a fixed number of permutations for these elements. So this is very clear. For example, if you have three elements, you start ordering them and you see that you cannot order them in so many permutations. So I can just, um, let's say, loop over the permutations and see what would be um, the distribution, the probability distribution of um, the elements in my set. Um, and this is essentially what we do in this, uh, in this NIPS paper. So instead of outputting only um, the output O1, which would be um, the output here in the middle, this is the state, which we call the state, so the bounding boxes that we want to predict. We also have to output the cardinality, so how many uh, do I have in my, uh, in my output state, and the permutation. Um, now, of course, the inference uh, couples tightly uh, the cardinality in the permutation so that I can output the correct number of, um, of bounding boxes. And so um, at training time, you actually compute the loss on the state, which is ordered given a certain permutation. So what you can do is um, you can have an output, then you have your ground truth, which is permuted, and you compute the correct match by using, for example, the Hungarian matching algorithm. And once you have them correctly ordered, then you can compute your loss. Um, at testing, of course, you don't really care about permutation. You just use um, the cardinality and the state to predict your output bounding boxes because you don't care in which order you actually output them. Now, um, what is really cool is that um, this actually works really well and we, do, uh, we can get good results. For example, for, uh, for detection, easily outperforming uh, faster RCNN and YOLO uh, on a bunch of uh, measures that are, um, that are used for detection. And uh, we get particularly good detections when there's a lot of occlusions, of course. So for example, in this case, we see um, so this is, the first one is faster CNN, then we have YOLO results, and then we have our results. And it's, it's not so easy to see, so maybe you can look at this offline, but um, you actually have two persons here, so maybe you see the two heads, uh, which are incredibly occluded. So the, the overlap between these two bounding boxes is so much that any non-maximum suppression would kill one of them. And still with our method, we're able to detect this, um, these two persons here. Um, so we can see, um, going more uh, into detail on the, on the results, that actually um, the network performs much better. So if you look at the first, uh, at the first graph, so you can see uh, on the vertical axis the F1 score. So it's one of the scores for, for detection. And on the horizontal axis, it's the overlap level of the bounding boxes. So you can see that as we increase the overlap level, um, our network, which is the, the blue um, line, is outperforming faster CNN and YOLO more and more because as we have more overlap, faster CNN and YOLO start killing more of the boxes so they cannot detect um, so many of the boxes. And uh, this, it happens the same with, uh, with all the graphs that we compute on, on precision, recall, or any of these, of these curves. And note that um, our detection is, is only one dot because we don't have this step of non-maximum suppression, so we cannot choose how many, um, how many boxes we keep. Um, now, an interesting task that we also tried was, um, let's say, uh, um, some uh, decomposition task, which was uh, we give uh, the network one number, and then we feed it also with um, an image with different numbers that are, um, that are overlapping and there are uh, all kinds of random numbers present. And now what we want is we want to predict uh, a number of digits that actually sums up to this number. So we haven't trained our network to do arithmetics or any, uh, any of the sort, but this is kind of a, uh, of a byproduct that we get from said learning. So for example, for this um, input eight, we get as output one, two, and five and the four is not detected as an object, as a, as a digit. Uh, if we just run faster RCNN, we see that um, most of the digits are detected because this is just an object detector, right? So we cannot encode any arithmetics in it. 
Okay, so um, this is a bit of a, of a fast overlap Oops. on um, on this set learning. So there's actually quite a lot of math in, involved in this uh, in this set learning. So I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested. Uh, but if you have any questions right now.